Hi! I guess everyone. Everyone in the Northern Hemisphere, at least. This guy's famous. He's gonna come up next. But first, shout outs to our new friends in uh, Bangladesh. <laughs> You're great. Thanks for watching. And we're Human Intelligence News. I'm Ryan, and uh, let's just get right to the report. Thanks for watching. All right, Steve, where have you been for the last couple of years? <laughs> I've been in the deep dark. Oh, it's better. The reason I went to get my degree originally uh, was because I worked for Steve. We're going to meet up with Steve Tuck, who's like a legendary botanist and pro expert. Please tell us about Mr. Tuck. Steve Tuck is a disabled veteran. My name is Steve Tuck. I'm here today to talk about some proper storage and curing. Steve Tuck is also an American expatriate, a former U.S. serviceman. They're just looking for the highest numbers, and they're wrong. That doesn't hit their body chemistry right. I was his personal assistant. He made me love science, and so I went to college and got my master's degree in biochemistry as well as molecular biology and molecular genetics. But one of the first things I noticed about Steve Tuck was that he did things like wore a suit wherever he went, and he talked scientifically rather than uh, like a pothead. And he referred to this as uh, his snake suit. Snakes don't bite other snakes. He's dressed like a snake and talk like a snake, and the snakes won't bother you. And so that was when I started learning that I had to wear my hair short and dress nicely if I wanted people to listen to what I was going to say. I was trying to find the uh, people in the movement that were more serious and more scientific and uh, more legitimate. And so when I met Steve and Mark made me take him around to a lot of growers and a lot of geneticists and botanists, people that did a lot of the same stuff he did, I noticed that not only was he able to talk to them on their own level, but he was talking about things that they had no idea even existed yet. He was seeing the, the future of the cannabis industry. That's part of science. It takes that micrometers, it takes microfuges, it takes uh, hoods, it's, that's the lab. Without that, you're in somebody's basement. One of the bigger problems early on was they would have names, and very rarely would that name be a consistent association with the strain. Steve actually started applying a lot of new genetics and techniques, uh, purification, extraction methods, things like that. Uh, he helped stabilize the seeds. I believe he developed nearly 200 different experimental strains and stabilized maybe 30 others. I've stabilized train wreck and brought it out of Humboldt County. He actually uh, created seeds that would create train wreck consistently. So that's one of the things he was famous for. One of the strains he developed uh, from scratch was heroina, and that one is uh, still famous now. I've developed a couple hundred strains, but my favorite one is called heroina. I bred it for pain and nausea and PTSD. He would design these for the people that were sick to help them with their ailments, but then at the same time, people that weren't sick would enjoy the unique cannabinoid profiles that he was developing. When 215 passed, uh, there were people uh, that were required to start pushing the law. In other words, start uh, using what it said and producing cannabis for patients. Steve was one of these uh, pioneers. He started uh, growing on a large scale, applying horticulture techniques. He followed all the rules. He made sure everything was inspection proof. I had a detective sitting out in front of my house doing stakeout. It was the funniest thing in the world was I called the police station and had them pass me through to him. I'm like, detective, if you want to come in out of the rain, come on in as long as you promise to behave yourself and I'll show you around. He would invite city officials in and make sure that everything he was doing was up to code. He would use genetics that he developed creating strains that were medically and economically efficient. He was trying to build something up that was developed around patients' needs essentially. Hello, my name is Steve Tuck. Glad to be with you again today. Um, I want to cover a few things on these Stash Logic cases. You can find them, remember, StashLogic.com. Uh, not being paid to say this, firm believer. Dude got a case snatched recently from DEA in the Port of San Long Beach. And it's really drawn my attention to it, which has really made me get a bunch and put them through the test for hell. And these are really nice cases, and they fulfill a lot of legal and responsibility roles we need as cannabis consumers. Uh, they're lockable. As you can see, you can put a combination to small ones for the bikes and stuff I use. 
I love these little things. We put it, me and my boys that work for me, we put it through hell. We keep these little pins in it. We keep these little hash pins for mobile. Little bit of wax for when you're going, you know. Got the weed here. Different kind of jars. And the beauty of it is you can lock her all down with a combination lock. That only you and your little self knows. To keep little fingers and pokey ass thieves out of it. You just roll her around again and she's done. I love this. This is my bike constant companion now. And this is, in case anybody wondered, usually what about a week for the weed for me looks like. And this is what I keep about a week at a time in. They have this is the big one. They're going to make an even bigger one for deliveries here soon. You can use this with Boveda uh, packs, which it, we they come with, and with smell packs, which are like these, the carbon packs that keep the smell out. So you make them pretty much scent proof. So I quit getting dirty looks at uh, Irvine Rouse with this thing. So it really helps on all up front. So being able to lock it, put all your different kinds of meds in there, and you can write on the top so the ones you want. You can have your little daytime stuff over here, your hybrids over here, your indicas for night over here, your waxes. Got my little pins. Tell you, man, this shit's right up, dude, up, man. And it's like, on top of that, it's got a big fat lock that I ain't giving no big fat cop no big fat combination to. So he ain't getting in my big fat bag, is he? And you can use this with CV box too. And with other shit, like I use these little platinum containers, you know, for my wax. And all of it just adds together for smell proof and for further a nice product man it really comes in handy it's secure from children it's responsible it's what they say they want from us you know let's meet them halfway and see if they're bullshitting or not and see what happens y'all have a nice day Steve Tuck was uh, actually this very interesting story he was a veteran who was injured during uh, his military stay I'm a honorable discharged disabled veteran I was hurt on duty uh, then further injured in a car accident I was in a wheelchair for six years I learned what it felt like to be helpless he was pretty much to the point where his body wasn't working anymore. I went through a year of my life when I couldn't leave my house. You know, if it hadn't have been for delivery, I'd have died. Through the use of cannabis to mitigate his use of morphine, he was able to function on a daily basis without having to take so much morphine it was killing him. Pain medicine doesn't work on me without cannabis. Cannabis was the one thing that saved me from my liver crapping out. Marijuana is the only thing that keeps me alive. Everything else makes me sick. I can't eat. Well, eventually, he was able to function like a normal human being and got this great education because he found this new inspiration of helping sick people get better using cannabis. What cured me was helping other people. The very interesting thing, when Steve Tuck first got here, he arrived with a box that contained 20,000 viable seeds of over about 60 different varieties. He sent them 20,000 seeds to our Canadian government research program. I donated a million dollars worth of seeds to Health Canada. That's when Health Canada wanted me to consult for them. In uh, 2001, he actually made a gift to Canada of a large quantity of uh, marijuana seeds, which he had developed because he has a degree in botany and horticulture and he brought them across the border from the United States with the cooperation of the Canadian government so Canada could start its medical marijuana program. I always tell people that was the point at which I bought my soul back. That was the first time I met Steve Tuck. Uh, the second time I met him was when he returned as the, uh, one of the first American refugees uh, running to Canada to try saving his own life. And that's a whole other story. Steve Tuck is an American expatriate, a former U.S. serviceman who is here who has uh, severe spinal degeneration. I wasn't afraid then at all of the law because I thought we were, you know, real legit and real. We had an incident. Peter McWilliams, Todd McCormick, and uh, Rene Boger had all been producing large amounts of medicinal cannabis uh, under the rules of 215, of course. You know, I was told all my life, if you don't like the law, change it. 
And when we voted in 215, I thought that was the law. But the government didn't like that they were being so open about it. What I was doing at the time was growing for hundreds of people and giving it away for free. Peter McWilliams and Todd McCormick were both medicinally necessary patients to where when they actually put Peter McWilliams in prison, he died. And this scared everyone. It made it so uh, anyone who had medicinal necessity, they had a real concern that they would be locked in prison without their medicine. So I freaked out and went to Canada as a refugee. When they started threatening his freedom and saying they were gonna lock him up without his medicine, he knew they were very serious, and he took this as a cue to leave to Canada. He was told that he would be locked up without morphine or cannabis, and he has had 13 back surgeries as a result of his military accidents. And so he came up to Canada. Steve came up here about six to eight months ago. Um, because he basically had been hounded in the United States. October of 2005 is when I was kidnapped from Canada. Canada fought and finally succeeded in sending him back to the United States to be punished for the act that produced the seeds which they used to start their medical marijuana program. Now, this is the most outrageous act of betrayal that I could imagine a country I was in the hospital getting ready to get operated on, and I was kidnapped out of the hospital. I was in there with tubes in me and under sedation and everything, and woke up to cops, eight of them standing there with guns on me. They have locked him up without medication and let him go into full-blown morphine withdrawal and agony. And the other day, I saw them take him out of an emergency room with a permanent catheter in the middle of a medical procedure and put in the backseat in handcuffs and driven to the U.S. border where he was turned over to U.S. authorities. I had tubes and everything on my body. They took it all out, put me in a truck and took me to the border at 120 miles an hour with Richard, Callan and my friends chasing them with a court order. They put me in jail and tortured me. Remember that he left the United States because he said that he was afraid of being locked up without morphine, without cannabis. And that is exactly what happened when he was turned to the United States. I had all these charges on me from all these years in Humboldt. After I got into America, they all subsequently were dropped. They got to keep all my stuff, all my money, and I had to go away from the medical cannabis movement for four years. I'm glad I didn't have to go to prison for the rest of my life or get killed there, but it really hurt my body a lot. I produce cannabis for patients who can't produce it for themselves or who are dying. I have 16 steel plates and pins in my back from a military accident. He has several steel pins in his mind. I've seen many of his x-rays. This is one of the pins that had to be replaced right here. They want this to fail. They want people to do without their medicine. They've left a trail of bodies behind them, and they don't care how far it leads. The worst is, is when you see these child cancer patients is what yeah. to get me. It just tears my heart out, you know, because it's like, man, everybody's going to die, but when you see a little kid dying and you, you can do something about it, you're like, man, I'm going to try something. You know, I'm not going to just sit here and watch this little kid die, man. You can put me in jail, you can shoot me. After you know you're fixing people, or this is what's really cool, after people like his family see the good, they can hear all the lies in the world they want in the future, but they'll mm -hmm. never go back to believing that's a bad thing. Some cops just can't accept this because really, you know, like this one cop had told me, I threw my kid up for this, you know, and he started crying. And they have a hard time coming to deal with that, you know? I mean, how do you deal with 20 years of breaking people's lives and busting them in the head and then all of a sudden you're gonna say, well, that's a good thing. And it's really hard for certain, not even police officers, officials, lawyers, judges, state representatives, to just get their mind around this could be medicine, this could help people, and the boogeyman stories have been told all these years, it's just that, you know, they're boogeyman stories. Marijuana, the burning weed with its roots in hell. We got shit, what, five, six states now legal, 20 medical, ain't nobody dead yet. So we essentially need to retrain our officials now and how they behave around this stuff. I think we all need to retrain ourselves in how we think about this stuff, how we think about all illegal intoxicants how we deal with them as a society. The one thing that I don't see they won't see is that 25% in every state that's legalized for medical or recreational, that's a drop off on deaths from opiates. 
That's the number one killer in America right now. Not only that, but it's pushing the cartels out. I mean, really, I mean, who in here is for the cartels? There's no denying what this does for people. There's no taking these soldiers who are alive right now and turning them back and saying, no, you gotta die. Uh, both his experience as well as the scientific knowledge uh, is something that can't be reproduced easily. And I think uh, he needs to pass it on to as many people as possible. My name is Steve Tuck. I'm here today to talk about some proper storage and curing of cannabis. The difference between it being dry versus being decarboxylated. That's just a big fat word, don't let it scare you. It really just means that it's dropped a water molecule. Very few people understand the scientificness of what cure actually means. That's why when people come across weed that's been cured perfectly, they think it's outstanding. They, because they don't understand that somebody knew what they was doing. Most of the time now it's done hanging in white rooms with dehumidifiers or, or humidifiers. It depends on where you're at. Like, it varies greatly around even the United States, let alone the world from like the humidity of Humboldt all the way to the deserts of Southern California, all the way to like the high, high alpine up here in Denver with 20% humidity outside. By the time you heat that air inside, it's almost negative humidity, it sucks it out of it. You don't want any light whatsoever. Light is your enemy to curing. It breaks down THC into, into CBN and CBCs and things like that, which is byproducts that we really don't want. You want that cannabis at between 10 to 13% moisture content from the second you can get it there until the second you smoke it. The one thing I can't overemphasize is people think if it's dry enough to smoke, it's cured, and nothing could be further from the truth is it's like whiskey. It smooths it, mellows it, and it brings all the chemical constituents to exactly what you want them to be. Crews in Humboldt, where I run the Humboldt Cannabis Center, and I've been staying up there, who's been putting sets of these to the test. And I got partners and business partners in the Inland Empire who live out in the desert who's been putting some sets to the test. And both test, have really surprised me with the results. They're doing a three month cure. The weed's turning out perfect. They got uh, some heroina and the, the two pounders and some train wreck in the pounders. And they said they're, they're looking really great on the outdoor. The down south, Dude Dunner just does a six week cure and I've already seen him smoke that weed and was quite impressed with it my own self. It uh, was LA Confidential and some pre-98 Bubba Kush, and it turned out to be both very, very good cannabis. These sea vaults for a small scale enthusiast. These are the first products here that I've seen that are truly plug and play. And it will take dry weed, turn it back to smokable, take wet weed, dry it out because of these cool Boveda packs. These are 62 percenter ones. What it really does is it keeps your cannabis between 10 and 13 percent. People think bone dry is cured and it's not. Bone dry loses a lot of the terpenoids and the Saskatchewan terpenoids and the smell and the taste. And they have that much capacity to give and to take away from moisture. They can either take and it keeps it what you want because while we do have $100,000 walk-in humidors to cure this with, you can't take it from Humboldt to LA or vice versa. And the beauty of these is the stackability and transportability of them. And so I've already had a couple buddies that's inquired about some bulk orders already because these things will allow you to uh, not only keep your cannabis perfect traveling amongst different environments, dry, cold, wet, rainy, heat, it's totally sealed, it's hermetically sealed. 
the, I love the small and the big because the big are for the growers and all that, and the small are for the users. And a lot of people don't got a lot of money and an ounce of medicine has to stay good for a long time. These can be used to cure, which is decarboxylation of cannabis, which is dropping the water molecule off the THC molecule. They can be used to bring back old stale weed. You could even put Mexican bullshit in here and it would make it twice better than it was in a week. This is really good equipment. I wouldn't put my name, we wouldn't put our company behind this if this wasn't real. Once again, my name's Steve Tuck. I'm a botanist and horticulturalist. I'm with Weed Maps, and we're glad to be able to show you what we believe is the cutting edge of technology, and we're always going to be on it and showing you the latest, not just fads, but the latest real products and teaching people how to use them. See you next time, it's been a lot of fun. Don't get too high without me. I'll see y'all later. This has been Steve Tuck for Weed Maps. Have a nice day. It was my dream my whole life to see that what's going on now in the world. Some crazy stuff going on. Legalization, Sessions, Trump. Willy Wony, who's gonna squash what? Patients are scared to death everywhere. We got as far as we did legality wise on the backs of the sick. If we just set this up for legalization for a few people at home, all you're really doing is legalizing it for rich white people. Patients, sick people, never be able to pass these DUI limits. People ain't getting got no business spending no money on no weed. And it's not about taking no market share from nobody. There's been a lot of I won't, I won't out and out call it victimization, but when you have a little kid who's having seizures and you're charging them $600 for a bottle of hemp sludge, I don't call it compassion either, you know? So you essentially get the same effect as the drug war before it was legalized, yeah. only now it's institutionalized enforcement. Not only that, but you no longer mm -hmm. have any defense. In Colorado, for instance, the medicinal patients had availability to cannabis before it was legal for recreational use. Uh, this supply was completely depleted for use on the recreational market. Not only was there none available for the medicinal patients, uh, but they were being forced to pay the full recreational price that everyone else was having to pay now. So where before they were being charged half that at the medical facilities. It's time there is regulations. It's time that we quit letting beat cops make up the regulations on the street. Now is the time for this to happen. We went from 2010 to 2016 for this bullshit of waiting for the times right. We passed our law just because, you know, President Orange Monkey wants to play games. Don't mean that now the will of the people is gone. I think more people voted for weed in this last election than voted for any politicians. There's so much money at stake right now. I mean, we're projected right now by 2020 in California for cannabis to be a $20 billion industry. Oh, and that $20 God. billion will come pretty much from the pharmaceutical and some of the alcohol and the tobacco industry. And they all know it. There's so many ways we need to learn about getting this in people and bringing on new products. So the industry right now is blowing up all over. Cannabis, it's probably going to reach a point to where it's nearly fully legitimate soon. And I don't think that most of the industry is ready to meet the needs of a legitimate industry. I'm here today with Josh and Kendra. They're from Farm Squad, which is a local organization dedicated to getting medicine to patients. I foresee within four or five years, Cannabis being one of the prime medicines of the United States, especially in the poorer states. We really gotta keep in mind, there's a huge difference between the medicinal class and the recreational class of user. Do you ever lab test anything? We do have our lab tested results. We do test our products. We test everything at our headquarters. And we like to keep everything up to date so that way um, patients are calling in for the right products and they're not misinformed. We are very close to our patients. The moment they call it, I know exactly who they are most of the time. <laughs> I know who you are every single time. We have legalization. Now we need industry trade groups. We need standards, rules, shit everybody agrees on. It's pretty easy to instigate standards in a recreational market. When you're developing products for, say, uh, AIDS patients or cancer patients, if you develop a product that 
uh, is infested with, say, mold, a person who has uh, a compromised immune system could actually die from smoking something with that. And so if you're producing something for medical patients, you have to have some kind of guarantees in place that you're not going to make them sicker than they already are. What they can't do is say, we can't have medicine, we can't have it here. You know, because there's a lot of elderly people here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And as you know, that's probably half y'all's business or more. For one, they have the dough to pay for it. For two, they don't want troop all over town with a bag of wheat in your car. Right. You know, and for three, they need shit explained to them. What you can do, you're great at. And I'll tell you what will surprise people the most is it'll be the older people who use these versus the younger people who go to brick and mortars. There's a big difference, I feel like, between, you know, the patients who go to a dispensary and the patients who do come to us. We are able to service the patients who are uncomfortable with leaving their homes. I feel like a lot of the patients who come to us are actually for medical reasons. We have a patient, and he actually just had undergone back surgery. He's the last person who would want to leave his house to uh -huh. go get the medicine that he would need. If somebody's had 13 back surgeries, I know how they feel. He's not yeah. having fun yeah. right now. We actually gave him a bunch of CBD samples, and it was his first time ever encountering CBD, and I told him, I was like, you're not gonna get that, um, that medicated feeling like you're normally used to with THC. Yeah. Don't expect that but do expect um, for a lot of your pain to be relieved. And then he gave us a call at the end of the day after he tried a few gummies, and he said he dropped all his medicine, and then he's the just sentence. converted to CBD Gosh. gummies. One of the biggest annoyances is to uh, hear the comparison of alcohol and cannabis. A lot of people think that cannabis is like alcohol. Nothing could be further from the truth. When you're smoking cannabis or eating it, uh, you're triggering one of the most ancient systems in your body, your endocannabinoid system. When you're drinking alcohol, all you're doing is uh, interfering with the connectivity between your neurons. You can habituate to cannabis. I used to go to school every day to college and I made straight A's. Once you habituate to it, it doesn't affect you like that, whereas nobody can habituate to alcohol. It's the difference between drinking poison and taking medicine. Uh, it's not even comparable. I think the marijuana industry can become a major source of revenue for um, states in America and, and, and worldwide. As cannabis becomes legitimate. GWPH, this stock will be up the most of any stock other than Allergan today. Why? Because this is a cannabis stock. I think a lot of the focus is moving towards making uh, more effective products for delivering the amounts of cannabinoid profiles a person's desiring. So if it's for recreational use, of course, you're gonna want products like uh, vape pens, or basically vaporizers in different forms and different heats that are in different sizes to make it both exquisite and efficient. We're moving towards smaller devices offering the same benefits that we used to get from having to do things like roll a joint and smoke the entire thing. We really already are coming up with uh, a rough outline of what is to come. Dixie elixirs and edibles went from commercial kitchen to commercial manufacturing plant almost overnight. Now all we have to do is make uh, more exquisite versions of what we're already doing and make them so they're longer lasting and user friendly. The illegal market has been forced to create so many products on its own that now that we're going to a legitimate market, it leaves an entire world of development and potential for sales. Last year, I've watched an explosion in the industry of new products. Dixie Elixir is also a big yeah. seller. Dixie Elixir drinks, tinctures, and cannabis-infused chocolate bars are sold in hundreds of pot shops around the country. I'll say for the first time in 30 years am I seeing new products come on. That got me excited. We're not 10% into the potential of what this can do. Nobody realizes this is still in its infancy. There's a few companies out there, like uh, some of these peripheral companies like Weed Maps are actually doing a really good job at uh, finding niche markets to where they can actually build industries from. Wait, do you do the Weed Maps menu? I do, yeah. So we like to keep everything up to date. Anything that we do have on our menu, our drivers do have. It's important to keep your weed maps update updated because 
I mean, people are gonna wanna know what they're getting or what they're ordering or what you have. Another thing is uh, pharmaceuticals. We essentially have the makings of real pharmaceutical research and medicine now. And this is where I think the cannabis industry is going to have to go if it's going to go beyond just being a recreational thing that people do on the weekend. That a delivery service it's a lot more personable. Amazon will deliver right to your house, <laughs> you know? Convenient. That's the way I look at y'all. You're on Amazon. There's people out there like me, like other people, who are so sick that we're always going to need this. You can definitely reach out to us uh, on our weed maps at Farm Squad, you know, Irvine, all the way out to Mission Viejo, coverage area, to Data Point, Laguna. Or you can contact us directly at 1-855-32-SQUAD. This is a really serious subject. We're talking about saving people's lives. There's so much medical utility to this. There's still thousands of people out there right now that don't even realize we can help them. I've seen the tip of the iceberg of how far this can go or the potential.